Hi everyone, my name is Anne. Welcome to my studio. This is Art on the Creek and I'm so glad you're here with me. Yesterday and today we're kind of talking about the Mondays that we get as artists and sometimes we have that white paper staring at us and we don't know what to paint. Well yesterday's video we painted this paintbrush back here so I'll put a link in the description to that one so you can check that out. But today what I want to talk about is another YouTube artist that I really respect and admire. Her name is Karen Rice. She does an awful lot of loose landscapes and I think it's just a wonderful exercise to follow in her lead. So let's do some loose landscape painting that we just have no plan for and see where it takes us. Are you ready for the journey? Let's go. I'm going to tape my paper around the edges using washi tape. Now washi tape is really good to have because you can see through it just a little bit. I like getting the patterned tapes because they always have some kind of a repeat pattern on them and usually that pattern is linear because you're dealing with the length of tape. So I can match the crook of one of those swans necks, find the repeat in the pattern and match that up where I can see through the tape so that I know that I'm getting a straight line. Um, when you're using washi tape to create a nice straight border, it really does help to have some kind of a guide. And since there's no grid on my board here, I just use the pattern in the tape. I'm going to use my Schmincke Horridum watercolors here, but first what I want to do, we're just going to be real loose about this. Um, so we're going to start with a wet paper. I have found there's nothing better than wet on wet to help you just loosen up. Uh, it really just lets that paint flow where it wants to. And uh, that's kind of what we're going to do today. I don't know how many of you follow Karen Rice. I'm going to put a link to the video that inspired me to do this tutorial today. I thoroughly admire Karen's work and she's always so cheerful and has such a good take on how to phrase things uh, to teach watercolor artists. And I've learned quite a bit from her. So I wanted to share this tutorial with you today in case you hadn't seen hers and just show you kind of my take on it. Um, using the supplies that I have at home. Uh, so here we go. I've got my 100% cotton B watercolor paper. It's all wet and I'm getting ready to go in with my Schmincke Horridum watercolors. I'm going to start with my number 14 Neptune round and I've got it pretty wet. I'm going to go in with a good amount of pigment. Just starting with a little bit of ultramarine here. I want to work on the sky first. And I like using ultramarine for the sky. I'm going to mix a little bit of Prussian blue though because I don't want the sky to be really bright and clear. I want it to have a little bit of atmosphere going on and uh, I'm going to bring it down a little bit with this Prussian blue. Prussian blue is actually one of my favorite colors. I really like using it. And uh, you can see there how it just adds a cool, a cool element to that, to, to that sky. And we're just gonna let the paint run just a little bit along uh, along that wet surface there. I'm leaving just a tiny bit of space for a suggestion of clouds and you'll see as our painting goes on those cloud spaces that I leave will get a lot smaller and that is simply because uh, the paint will continue to travel over that wet surface. Now I'm going in with a variety of greens here. In the Schmincke Hortum set they include a phthalo green and a permanent olive. I really like the permanent olive. I use it quite a bit. Um, the phthalo green I'm using right now, I don't use it as much. Um, it's a great mixer for me. I really love to mix any of the phthalos with a purple because you can get some really deep, rich forest colors. But one color that's in this palette that I truly love is the English Venetian Red. I love it and I'm mixing it here with a little bit of that ultramarine. I like the way they separate. And I'm just putting in a suggestion of of growth or rocks or whatever. I don't really know what this is going to be yet as I'm painting. I'm just kind of tapping color in, just keeping that horizon line differentiated from the sky and um, just kind of trying to create some interest of, I'm thinking something different in the middle, but I don't know yet. I don't know what it will be. And uh, just kind of trying to tap in the color here, get some different gradients of color going. And then we'll go into our next bit of yellow ochre, which I really love. This is a a nice mix to put in the foreground. I Here where I live we have an awful lot of uh, golden grasses that tend to stay that color gold year round. I am really itching for springtime though as I'm recording this on a chilly Monday in February and uh, I just wanted to uh, 
get some wildflowers going because it's so nice when you have a field of wildflowers. Now what I'm going to paint really doesn't exist in Colorado. <laughs> we just don't have that many wildflowers. Our uh, springtime in the Rockies, as the song goes, doesn't really happen until uh, mid-June. And um, we're not that high up with any elevation, but the wildflowers that we have are uh, very few and far between because I live in a very high desert area and uh, we just have very few wildflowers. So I was thinking of a meadow. The salt I'm using today is really kind of fascinating. I'll see if I can put a link to it. I'll try and remember. These crystals are huge. They're really fun to look at just to experiment and look at the salt. You can use any kind of salt you want. Um, you can use uh, iodized salt, plain table salt, uh, kosher salt, salt flakes, him pink Himalayan salt. You can use whatever you want. I just got this particular one. It was the first one I grabbed. Now what the salt will do is it will absorb the water a little more quickly because that's the chemical reaction with salt. Water wants to go to salt. Look at these crystals. Aren't they exciting? That's kind of a, a little pyramid almost. So we'll put them in there and see if they do anything different. To be honest, I have found that these work about the same as every other salt that I've ever used. I just like uh, I just like them and thought they'd be fun to keep in my studio. So we're going to let that go. We can't dry this with a heat tool because that will defeat the purpose of the salt. When you put salt down on your watercolor painting, what you're doing, as I was saying with the chemical process, is water likes to go with salt. So the water will leach onto that salt crystal and create a tiny little cauliflower bloom around it. And it will look just like, uh, just like a little starburst. So what we're doing here now, if you guys in the United States remember Blockbuster, it was the place where we would rent movies from, our VHS tapes and our DVDs. And I found this, Lord knows where, <laughs> very recently, Blockbuster's been out of business forever. But I found this fairly recently and I thought, oh, this is perfect. I'll just cut up this old gift card and I will use it in my watercolor. So I'm tapping it in that puddle of paint there just to kind of reestablish that horizon line. Remember that as watercolor dries, it will, you'll always have a color shift. It shifts a couple of shades lighter. So I wanted to have a little bit more concentration of paint along the horizon there. So what I'm doing is just tapping the edge of that piece of that gift card and um, in that little puddle of gray that I made. And I'm just kind of tapping it along to accentuate that horizon line. You can really see that that salt is starting to do its magic. So that's kind of fun. Um, now I've got in my hands a fan brush. This is a really old one that I've had for acrylic and I think it's hog hair or some kind of synthetic like that. Um, but I just thought I'd play with it today and see what I can uh, create with some texture here. So I think I've decided this scene now that that salt has had a chance to work. I think that it really looks more like a meadow looking off into the distant forest and those the forest back there might be a deciduous forest where the leaves have not yet come out on the trees. So I'm just kind of using this fan brush to just help establish a little more density and depth to that forest. Now I've set the painting aside and let it dry for quite a while, probably a good hour or so. And I'm using a paper towel to just gently wipe off that salt. It does kind of stick to the paper, so you do need to use a little bit of pressure, but I prefer using a paper towel to, um, to just using my, my finger. I always feel like, um, your skin it has oils in it and uh, you don't want to touch your painting too too much. I have my favorite brush. I should give him a name. I use him all the time. I don't know. I name my vehicles. Do you guys name your cars? I do. <laughs> my car is named Jules. Um, J-U-L-E-S. He's a he's a male vehicle. Anyway, um, <laughs> the, uh, the brush I'm using now is a number eight round Princeton and I'm um, just trying to get some more blue into this uh, into this mix here just making a little bit darker version of gray. I'm mixing that uh, ultramarine in with some sepia. And what I'm going to do is just kind of try and create the mid layer of these uh, leafless trees that are back here. And to do this, my uh, brush is kind of pointed straight up and down. So I apologize that my hand is in the way just a little bit, but you'll see that I'm starting at the bottom, drawing upward. I'm very barely letting the brush touch the paper. So I'm just kind of drawing up, making a lot of loose trunks in there. Uh, filling in some branches wherever I think it would look appropriate. For the middle section here, I'm going to focus a little bit more on uh, yellow ochre. I don't think I'm going to really fill this middle section with trees. I'm going to try to make a suggestion that this part of the forest is further back. 
and maybe at a slightly different elevation. So I kind of wanted to suggest that maybe the sun was shining in this area just a little bit more or it was uh, more populated with grasses. So I'm just kind of going in with that yellow ochre and um, trying to pull that uh, pull that yellow up, adding a little bit to the forest on either side, the, the deciduous forest, but not really focusing in a lot of detail at all at this point. Now I've continued those uh, suggestions of tree trunks throughout that whole horizon line, and now I'm going in with some of the phthalo green and just darkening up this grass horizon here. Because as I often say in watercolor, and as I'm sure that you will notice as you're working, as soon as you darken an area, you might need to adjust the values of the adjacent areas because sometimes you just kind of, it's a, it's like a process of continually fine tuning. Sometimes I describe watercolor um, to people of a certain age, those of you that remember having to adjust the tint and, uh, and color, tint and contrast and, uh, um, oh, what are they, brightness. The tint, contrast, and brightness on your color TV. Uh, if you're from an era where you remember having to do that or having to do that for your parents, then that's kind of how I think of watercolor. I think of it as just this, uh, you start out with something very out of focus and you gradually make these adjustments in value to just kind of bring things into focus. So just pulling that, uh, that grass down into the foreground a little bit. And now I think it's time for some splatter. I like to protect the area that I'm not splattering and I'm so proud of myself for actually remembering to do that this time. <laughs> I, as many of you know, I often forget to protect the area around what I'm splattering and uh, that does get a little bit interesting. Starting with some yellow ochre and then I'll go in later with some green, just splattering all along the bottom here to just kind of get some suggestion of uh, different growth that might be happening in the meadow. This will all be just a little bit out of focus when it's finished, but it will definitely give it some color and depth. And here you can see I'm adding those green splatters as well. I've just kind of mixed that green into that gray mix there and just kind of trying to uh, continually use similar locations on my palette for these uh, darker mixes to just kind of try and continue that, uh, that harmony in the painting. So just trying to add some, uh, some splatters up more toward the horizon where I didn't quite get high enough there and uh, then we'll come back and do our next step. Now that we've got this thoroughly dry, and I did want to use a heat gun at this step because I do want to make sure all of those splatters are dry. It's very easy to just accidentally set your hand in a splatter and then it just becomes a very, uh, very inconvenient kind of a smudge. I'm going to mix up some uh, rather large pile of green here. I think what I'm going to do is get this blockbuster card out again <laughs> and I'm going to make some grasses in the foreground because now, I'm, now that I'm looking at this and it's kind of coming into focus a little bit with all of those fine-tuned adjustments that we've got, I think it needs a little bit of definition in the front, in the very foreground. So I'm using my edge of the card to just pick up the paint out of the puddle and tap it in. Now you can use a palette knife to do this. You can use the back end of your paintbrush. You can use a twig. Karen Rice likes to use a twig a lot and I have, uh, I do have a twig in my paintbrush collection. I, I went and found one um, as, her, as she suggested and it's been a lot of fun to use. So if you can find a twig and just put it at the end of your pencil sharpener or uh, use an edge of a credit card like this or your palette knife and even the end of your brush, any of these things will work. Uh, you want to do this gently, um, however, at this point, because this will, if you press down on this, it will leave a permanent mark in your paper. And that is another technique, but that's not what we're doing here just yet. I'll go back and add some different kinds of grasses in the foreground, but for now, that's what I want to have right there. And I'm going to go back now to the tree because I want to, I want to be able to work on this, uh, finishing this, uh, painting in a detailed kind of a work a little bit here, work a little bit there. Since I'm doing all these fine tuning uh, adjustment steps, I like to uh, move around in the painting and not focus on two, one area too much at a time. This is just very loose, very abstract. So you, you have a lot of freedom with how you want to work on this. So now I'm putting the trees in that would be closest to the foreground. And I've added some pigment along the bottom there just to suggest that dense change of, of ground. And you know how the, the uh, forest floor has a lot of mulch and uh, dead pine leaves or dead leaves and it creates that really dark rich soil. That's kind of what I'm trying to suggest back there. So I have used the ivory black this time. I don't know if I mentioned it in this video or in another one, but I will definitely say it again. Um, if you're going to get an ivory black or a Chinese white or whatever it is in your palette of watercolor, you know, you don't have to use them, but the way I look at it is this, they're good paints. Go ahead and use them. It, there's no rule that says you can't use ivory black. You certainly can. 
Um, you know, it's always a great idea though to mix your blacks because that will give your painting a lot of depth and dimension. However, if you're going to use the black to darken a shade, which is just what I'm doing here, I'm using the black to darken that sepia and then that will help me establish those uh, leafless trees that are closest to the viewer. So now I think I'm gonna clean out my ceramic palette and let's get out some gouache. I have here some uh, Holbein Permanent White. If you're going to get any gouache in your life, I recommend getting a tube of white gouache and you can see I got a real big one because you do end up using it quite a bit. Um, you can use a bleed proof white, you can use um, a gouache, you can use a pastel pencil. I really wanted to do this, um, continuing to do this in the style of Karen Rice and she definitely does love her white gouache at the end so I really wanted to um, pay homage to her and continue this in her style. So I'm just loosening up that white gouache by um, putting some water in that uh, other well there and then just mixing until I have a good amount of thickness. And once again, I'm going to cover the parts where I don't want the white splatter. This is such a lovely way to make little tiny white blossoms. Uh, just, I always think of little baby's breath when I'm doing this. Um, I certainly had baby's breath in my wedding bouquet and it does grow wild here in Colorado, but um, you know what? I don't think I've ever really seen it. Uh, like I was mentioning before, our wildflowers where I live are kind of few and far between. Um, however, let's go ahead and add some of that yellow ochre to the white gouache so that we can bring some of the yellow splatters that we did before. Those would represent the flowers that are further back. And now by brightening this yellow up by adding some more white, we're brightening it, making it more opaque, it will come to the foreground. So for me right now with these yellow splatters, I think I'm kind of uh, got a little bit of snapdragons on my mind. Those I have seen in abundance on the trails in our area and uh, it's just what this made me think of. For this next step, I'm going to pull out a grainer brush. This one happens to be a 3 8 inch Filbert Grainer by Princeton. It's a velvet touch. It doesn't hold as much water as the Princeton Neptunes do. So you kind of have to play with it a little bit. It's, it's a different brush all around any of these specialty brushes, you kind of have to play with them um, just to familiarize yourself with, uh, with the best way to use them. So what I like to do with this one is uh, put it in the paint that I've mixed and then kind of use that brush to play around with different levels of water just to kind of see what's optimal for this mix. And um, what I'm doing is I'm mixing both greens and a little bit of uh, uh, the blue from the sky. The ultramarine blue is gonna come into this mix as well. And I think I even pull in some pressure at the end. And I'm just pulling these grasses. I'm just trying to fill that plain green area back there in with some grass-like textures. I'm not doing it very heavily. It's just gonna be kind of a subtle effect. And then I'll pull that down to the foreground where we can get some, uh, some more def definitive grasses toward the front. Let's move on to that. The best tip I can give you for when you're making grasses uh, toward the front that are gonna be very, very uh, prevalent to the viewer, keep your brush strokes not evenly spaced and not equally parallel. So you'll see I've got a little bit more concentrated to the left, a uh, little bit uh, blue in front of the green, and I tried to make the grass grow in a bunch of different directions. So it's not completely uniform. I have one more specialty brush to show you. Um, this is a liner brush, and the one I'm using is by Mimic. It is an imitation squirrel, and this is a number one. Uh, liner brush. It's either called a liner or a rigger. This one actually happens to be called a rigger. But do you see these errant spots that I got in the sky? Rather than to try and lift them out, I'm going to turn them into birds. When you're doing little V birds like this, it's a good idea to not put the wings all at the same uh, pattern, just like the grasses. You want to give these birds a moment in time that is not all synchronous. So the bird there at the top, his wings are going up. The bird just below him to the right, his wings are spread out more. The bird to the left, the wings are almost flat. And then the bird to the right is kind of mid flap. So let's give this a final dry and see where we're at. I've got the painting dry and now it's time to take the tape off. I'm using the heat tool because sometimes this paper has torn on me before um, with the tape. I'm just making sure that one little bird up there is completely dry because I don't want to set my hand in him. And you know what? I think this turned out just fine. I was having some trouble with my fountain pens, so I'm just going to sign this with this Tabilo All Pencil. And there you go. There's our little loose landscape in the style of Karen Rice. 
Once again, I'm going to link to her video in the bottom. I so love her channel. I hope you enjoyed spending time with me today as we learn to loosen up in the style of Karen Rice and make a really nice landscape. Everyone have a great week and we'll see you next time. Bye now.